Okay, so I hope this is gonna come out well. I'll see you later uh, if uh, the video turns out okay. So I don't have to use any more my, uh, my camera, my GoPro. All right, uh, so let me just put this on and then we can start. Okay, so last time we were talking about uh, sheer strength and we said that the rocks have strength which is uh, in addition to cementation is due to frictional strength and that's b basically this this same type of uh, frictional strength that you have in a in a solid that is um, subjected to a force, normal force Fn, and because of that, uh, you need a, a force which is gonna be proportional to the friction coefficient in order to move it. Well, it's the same thing in rocks. And with that, we arrive to this line, which is a shear failure line, and which actually has a name. I don't know if you guys remember the name for that line. It starts with M. No, this, this is a more circle, right? This is a more circle. Uh, now, what is what is the, the red one? This one is usually goes by the more Coulomb failure criterion and <coughs> it's called like that because Coulomb came, came up with it but it was used using more circles so that's why it's called the more Coulomb failure criterion and this case remember was for uncemented sands but we saw that <coughs> we can write something very similar now for a cemented rock and in this case, this is also the same thing. Is a more Coulomb uh, failure criterion. And remember that this one is for shear strength. Okay. Um, let, let's remember too that in case of a cemented rock, we can apply a vertical stress on it uh, without any stress from the side and it's going to be this more circle and the maximum stress at which it fails this is something that you did in the laboratory we measure we like to measure stress but well, i don't know if you like to do that i like to do that measure stress as a function of strain uh, we load the rock there is a period of linearity that's where we measure the young modules and it tells us the stiffness of the rock and usually goes through a peak and that peak it's a maximum principal stress and uh, that is that value over here when the confinement is equal to zero uh, we call this one also UCS and this is what you see in the Mohr circle the maximum stress What's the on the second uh, this one yes. one number one because this is the maximum principal stress and Sigma 3 because it's the least principal stress and remember that in this case Sigma 3 is equal to Sigma 2 okay so uh, that's the unconfined compression strength test and you have done that in the laboratory and you have measured that already uh, do you guys remember the value that you measure for that how many psi was um, you tested birria you tested the other one what was the name texas boise and texas cream right if I remember correctly, Berea is about 3,000. 
Boise is about probably a little bit more, don't remember well. It depends also, also on the orientation of the rock uh, with the bedding plane. And Texas was a little bit, uh, Texas screen was a little bit weaker, about 2000. That's what I remember. Pro probably I'm, I'm a little bit off, okay? Uh, typical rocks have, cemented rocks have an unconfined compression strength of a, a few thousand psi. And there might be some others like shales uh, and very strong carbonates that can get easily to 10 to 15,000 psi. Um, so the rocks that you tested are, are not that strong. There are, there are rocks which are much stronger than that. But let's come back to what we were doing over here. Um, so, if we apply now confinement to a rock, the same that we did with the coffee package that we tested here on Wednesday, if now sigma three is different than zero, I'm gonna be able to apply a much larger sigma one. And this is this case is this new sigma three, which is not zero, and this new sigma one of this circle over here. It's that circle. And because of the frictional strength, also uh, I'm going to be able to resist a much larger stress on the vertical direction. But now, what is sigma three? Why would sigma three increase? Can, can we now get this back to the field? What is sigma three? It will be, it depends. Uh, sigma three is always, always the least principal stress, but it's related to the overburden. And in the case of normal faulting or strike slip, it's related to the horizontal stress. But this means confinement. Usually when you go deeper, sigma three increases. The effective principal stress uh, increases, and therefore, as you go deeper, also usually rocks get stronger. And in order to test uh, real rocks that are of interest of us in real conditions, we need to apply confinement to them to explore what are the failure properties of those with confinement, not without confinement. Usually now, there is uh, people do not do this kind of tests without any confinement. Uh, usually the minimum confinement applied to this kind of rocks is about 100 PSI. All right, so you could make this test of uh, measuring the maximum peak stress. So in this case, now it's gonna be very similar to the previous one, but now I'm gonna have to be more specific this axis is going to be sigma 1 minus sigma 3. And this is going to be the strain. And similar to the previous one, this is going to be like this, but now it's going to be larger. And this is going to be the peak sigma 1 minus sigma 3. N what is sigma 1 minus sigma 3 in the Mohr circle in terms of a uh, geometrical quantity? is the diameter. So <coughs> what we're plotting there is the diameter of the circle. The bigger the confinement, the bigger the mean stress, the bigger the diameter is going to be. Okay, but uh, we could draw the circles and we're going to do that in, in, in a sec and we could fit a line to those circles. But sometimes uh, fitting a line to intersect the tangent of the circle, it's a little bit difficult. Uh, it's not that easy. It's much easier, and it's exactly the same thing, to look at these uh, failure properties of rocks, uh, not in terms of normal stress and shear stress, uh, where actually this is how the rock fails, right? The rock always fails because there is a plane that has the maximum
ratio of or combination of shear stress to normal stress. That's why the rocks fail. But let me show you another plot which is going to make easier to calculate what is this friction coefficient and what is that uh, cohesive strength. And instead of plotting tau and sigma n, we're just going to plot directly sigma 1 and sigma 3. And when we do that, this is going to be a plot which looks something like this. I'm going to write here a least effective principal stress sigma 3 on the x-axis, uh, maximum effective stress at failure in the y-axis and simply I'm going to draw points in this uh, space and I'm going to feed the line to that. The first point for the cemented rock uh, right here <coughs> sigma 3 is equal to, equal to 0. What is going to be the value of that point? The maximum stress. How do we call that? Let me show you, give you a hint, appearing right there, UCS, unconfined compression <laughs> strength. Whenever, let's put this one on top of that one, whenever uh, the confine is zero, the maximum stress a rock can take is going to be the UCS. And we're saying that as we increase sigma 3, the sigma 1 is always going to get larger and larger. And similar to that line, uh, we're going to have here a line that simply is going to be, say that sigma 1 is going to be at least the UCS and it's going to be proportional to sigma 3 through a parameter that we're going to call Q. And uh, notice that we derived what that parameter was in the, in the previous lecture. Let's say that UCS is equal to, uh, to zero. So uh, this one, for example, is a cemented rock. And I could also draw another one over here where sigma 1 is just equal to q times sigma 3 and if the UCS is 0 then this is going to be an what kind of rock? it's going to be uncemented or unconsolidated because uh, it has zero strength whenever there is no confining uh, stress <coughs> this, this, this is like loose sand or ground coffee with no uh, stress on the sides. And Q is just going to be sigma 1 divided by sigma 3, right? And, and we found that equation last time. And if you remember, sigma 1 divided by sigma 3 uh, was equal to 1 plus the sine of the friction angle divided 1 minus the sine of the friction angle. And if we want to compare now this curve, you want to stay here, guys, 60 more minutes? <laughs> Maybe? Okay. And if we want now to compare, we know now what is the relationship between friction angle and Q where Q is this, this is 1, this is Q, it's the slope of that line. Now we'd like to have a relationship between UCS and S0. UCS is something real, something that you measure. S0 is just a fitting variable, and it's called cohesive strength. And I don't remember the questions for that, so I'm going to take a look at my notes over here. But you can uh, calculate that. It's, it's just uh, some uh, some algebra and some trigonometry 
and let's see where I find that. I don't have it here, but I'm sure I have it in my notes. So uh, let me go quickly over here. By the way, um, I don't know if you have been already reading the, the notes for what we're talking about uh, right now, but I updated the notes. Uh, there are some problems that were unsolved, and I, I, I solved those, so I, everything is updated. And also, today, I'm going to make a PDF out of this, uh, uh, up to this chapter, and I'm going to upload that online too, so if you want to print it out, or start from there. You have everything in a single document, and, and you don't have to do a thousand clicks uh, to, to get through the material, okay? Um, so, let's see. I think we were here. Okay, this is what we were looking for, and that's the question that I needed. So, UCS is going to be related to the cohesive strength and it's going to be equal to 2 times cohesive strength times square root of Q. Uh, so let me come back over here. No, now we have the two type of plots and um, they are, they're exactly the same. But it's just it's much easier to feed experimental data using this space than that space. Yes, Mr. Willer. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, why are we choosing C to be 30 degrees? No, we're not setting the friction out to be 30. That's something that you have to calculate. OK. Well, in every example, we've used 30 degrees. Right? No, no. I, I, I use 30 degrees uh, just as an example. Okay. So you, re you remember more or less what is going to be the friction angle, what is going to be the friction coefficient. Uh, and uh, what is going to be this parameter Q. Okay. So, I think now we have everything that we need in order to solve the problem number one, okay? And it, the problem number one is about a sand. So let me come back uh, over here. Here you have some values of properties of, of real rock. So you, s you can see big stress for sedimentary rocks, usually lower than 100 megapascals, which is 100 megapascals, it is uh, how many PSI? I, I forget, it'll be uh, five, like 15, 15,000, something like that. Uh, okay, so <laughs> let me go to the, to the problem. Mm. All right, and I fixed the table also in in the second chapter, but now I fixed this one too. Uh, all right, this is problem number one. We need to find what is the friction angle of this sand. This is a sand uh, from the Gulf of Mexico that we tested here in the laboratory uh, some time ago. And we know, let me tell you now, uh, just to make it simple, that sigma 3 is going to be equal to PC minus PP uh, because there is no pore pressure. And sigma 1 is going to uh, be equal to sigma 3 plus this amount, OK? Um, and our objective here is that, let me, let me write that. So I'm going to put this table here on the side. And wait, where did that go? I don't know where the. Okay, here it is. Uh, I, I saw someone raising 
uh, hands, no? Okay, so uh, let, let me show you what we have to do here. Uh, in this problem, uh, sigma 3 is going to be equal to confining pressure minus pore pressure and sigma 1 is going to be sigma 3 plus sigma 1 minus sigma 3 which is the value that you have in the table and notice here that S1 minus S3 which are total stresses is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 which are effective so this is total and this is effective so what you have to do what um What you have to do now is use your computer or just, you know, do it uh, on paper. Plot sigma 1 and sigma 3, draw a line, and tell me based on these, these equations over here, what is going to be the friction angle. I'll give you another equation that's going to help you to compute the friction angle as a function <coughs> of Q. Okay? So, three data points you have a fitted line to those in terms of sigma 1 and sigma 3 okay so start working on that and uh, I'll, I'll pull up this equation that, that you need Let me know if you have questions. Okay?
Yeah, this is like the experiment that we had here, right? Remember that we had atmospheric pressure everywhere? So that, that would be the equivalent of your yeah. tiny pressure. Yeah. Uh, in addition to that, you're adding an additional stress, which is this one, which is the one that we measured. Working? Yeah. You have it. Did you solve it already? Yeah. Go down the memory. 
Let's see. Uh, let's see a solution to this. Uh, remember, uh, this experiment and the data I'm showing here, uh, it's uh, without pore pressure, and that means that all the confining stress is just going to be the confining pressure from the outside. In our experiment in the class, we had atmospheric pressure. In this particular experiment, we have a pressure vessel that I'm going to draw in a minute to to let you know how it works. And since there is no pore pressure, this sigma 3 is just going to be the confining pressure. This is going to make a lot of sense uh, in a bit as soon as I explain this a little bit more, okay? And this value of deviatoric stress, this is basically the diameter of the Mohr circle. And if you want to get the value of sigma 1, you need to add the diameter to sigma 3, okay? This column uh, over here, this one is just the diameter. So sigma 1 is going to be equal to the diameter plus sigma 3, and that's going to be sigma 1, and then I can plot this, and I'm going to use a scatter plot, and this is the result, where y-axis is in the in the <coughs> sigma one is in the y-axis, sigma three is in the x-axis. Then you feed the line to this, so add trend line, and here you go linear, and then you say set intercept to zero. Okay. I'm not going to show you the result because you have to do this at home. Okay. But you may want to do display equation on chart. That's going to give you the value of Q, okay? And that's going to be the line. And it looks like here, Q is more or less, look, if this is, this is about 40, 40 divided by 10, that's about 4. So Q is equal to 4, uh, more or less. You'll get the value when you uh, do this in Excel uh, on your own. You know what is Q? Uh, from here, you can calculate directly what is the friction angle. Okay. Uh, now, you have the friction angle for this test. Um, I'll come back to this if we have time about how to draw a more circle in Excel, okay? But, but before we do that, uh, let, let me go a little bit more on to showing these triaxial tests, how they work, and how to make sense out of them. Yes? This is Q minus 1 divided 2 times the square root of Q. Okay. Uh, something very important. Uh, I was uh, taking a look <coughs> at the coffee experiment that we did in class and I calculated wrong the area. You remember that I was eyeballing an area of, of 3 square inches? Well, it was not 3, it was uh, 5.2, okay? 
and actually if you use a 5.2 you will see that the actual stress in our experiment the axial stress at uh, the peak of failure was about 53 psi and 53 divided the 15 that we had is about 3 right so very close to what uh, we have uh, said that it would be and something else I didn't specify this but when we're, we're doing our test with the coffee if this is Sigma and this is uh, strain it look more or less like this it approaches the limit and that is the value that we measured here uh, that was about 53 psi there was a point in which I was it wasn't increasing anymore and that's what we chose uh, as our peak okay so let's now uh, try to expand uh, these kind of triaxial experiments to see how we can obtain a bigger confining stress that would be the one that eventually we will need to understand properties of rocks uh, in the field so if you want to increase confining stress what would you do you get a sample of rock this is your rock and we want to increase its confining around it what what would you do well very similar to what we did uh, in class you want to put a some sort of sleeve or membrane around the rock so you can pressurize it now it's not going to be the atmospheric pressure anymore but it's going to be uh, a pressure that we're going to apply with the fluid and it looks very similar to this so this is a real one so you have a, a carbonate rock inside and you can see that we have this membrane <coughs> around it made out of a, a teflon based uh, shrink tube and uh, th this is the way we do it in the laboratory you're going to do something slightly different in the lab yourselves but it's the same principle so we put this into a sleeve into a membrane and then we put everything into a pressure vessel and you're going to use these pressure vessels in the laboratory as well so first of all we put some end caps uh, made out of usually steel and we put everything into a pressure vessel that is usually filled with a fluid like hydraulic oil or like water you're going to use water uh, here there is going to be something else and these pressure vessels you usually when you're going to go high pressure they're also made out of of steel so they can resist the pressure that you put in those we can go very high in the experiment class we had an atmospheric pressure of 14 psi but for example the the vessel that i have downstairs it goes up to 20,000 psi which is uh, quite higher than uh, 14 psi so you would put your rock inside the pressure vessel um, with a membrane around it and then you apply a pressure to the fluid so that pressure exerts a stress through a membrane into the sample and in order to increase the pressure here uh, we connect here something very very similar to a syringe but it's a, a big syringe and a very powerful syringe so you can push fluids inside and from here you can measure what is your confining pressure 
the confining pressure is going to apply the pressure outside the rock. Um, let's imagine this experiment right now. If we were to increase the pressure, do you think this thing inside is going to move or not? Outside here is atmospheric. So I imagine this in your head that you're increasing the, the pressure inside and I'm, I'm wondering if this is going to move, the rock and the end caps. So remember, this is the vessel and these are the, what do you say? Raise your hand if you think it's going to move. If it's not going to move, raise your hand. Why do you think it's going to move, yeah, Mr. Wood? Okay, but what does it mean here, all directions? It's been squeezed, but it's been squeezed from all directions, right? So everywhere around here, this is going to reach an equilibrium. It's not going to move to the sides. But notice here there's a gap, okay? There's a gap here, there's a gap there. There's going to be also a pressure in this direction. And the pressure in this direction, let's say it's a thousand psi. What is the pressure on top? It's atmospheric, so unless you put a force here on the top, it's going to move up, and that's going to happen to you in the laboratory, okay? When you pressurize it, you will see that you will read in the low frame a force which is equivalent to the pressure times the area of all of these uh, pushing up. And usually here we put another low cell. Um, okay, so if you pressurize, everything is going to go up, okay? Uh, but now, in order to uh, increase the um, stress in this direction, that's when we push here with the stress S1 and with the load frame so that we can have a stress which is bigger in this direction than in this direction. So this one is going to be S3 and those going to be S1. This is exactly what you're going to do in the in the laboratory, and when there is no pore pressure, sigma one, S one is going to be equal to sigma one, and S three is going to be equal to sigma three, and this is what we have right now. Mm -hmm. And usually you do this with dry rocks, and this is the same what you're going to do in the lab. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, so uh, usually what we do in the lab is, as a function of time, uh, we increase S3 and S1 will increase at the same time. Then we keep S3 constant and then we continue increasing S1 till we observe the failure. Okay, so this is when there is no pore pressure and usually we do this with dry rocks. However, it's very important to have uh, rocks which are filled with fluids because in, in the subsurface, uh, the rocks are not dry. They have fluids, they have water, they have oil, they have gas, they may have other fluids. So in order to make this more realistic, what we do is we get another pump which connects to the pore space of the rock and also this one is very similar to a syringe pump and actually I don't know if you noticed that guys but in the laboratory when you run the test you haven't used them yet but on the right side of the low frame you have this syringe pump that its cost is, is higher than many cars uh, around here uh, it is a very precise equipment but it's just a syringe big syringe if you look in the back of these syringes you will see this screw that moves up and down the piston and here 
uh, usually we will fill this with the fluid of interest, which many times is, is brine. So that goes inside and that pressurizes the fluid in the rock. And if we were to put here a pressure gauge, that will give us what is PP, the pore pressure. And in order to make these experiments realistic, the, when we fill this with the fluid, uh, we want a pore pressure which is, which is not zero. So when we have now pore pressure, what is going to be sigma three? is S3 minus PP and we know that S3 as it goes through the <coughs> membrane is confining pressure minus pore pressure and sigma 1 is going to be S1 minus PP. What is S1? And, and here is where you have to pay attention because it depends on the device. Okay, S1, you can measure it directly here. Force divided by area is going to give you S1. And that, that is going to be, if you measure it in the, load cell, which is outside the vessel, that is going to give you S1. However, the experiments I have given you, they were conducted in my fancy triaxial cell, which is across your room. Sometimes, you know, when you go downstairs and if you see this lab with, uh, uh, with a transparent uh, window, well, that's my lab. And, and right next to it, if you see a gigantic thing, uh, that's, that's a triaxial cell. That's a huge triaxial cell. And in that one, we have a low cell which is inside and that low cell which is in my lab it measures it doesn't measure S1 but measures S1 minus S3 because it's inside the low cell okay so be very careful with, with this in the, in the lab, the experience you're going to do, I'm going to measure this one in, um, in my lab and the files I'm going to give you to work with, you're going to measure this one. So, now knowing this, uh, you can start working on solving problem number two and problem number three. Problem number two, it's a triaxial test with a confining pressure <coughs> and still, still is a dry rock. And number three, it's a test with a confining pressure but now with a pore pressure. So make sure that you compute sigma one and sigma three uh, correctly, okay? Yes, Mr. Wheeler. Yes. 